These five players were bound to crash and burn in their NBA careers. Starting out with Bronny James, who seems to be doomed before his career has even had a chance to begin. Although it's too soon to label the Bronny James experiment a failure, it's definitely soon enough to make the prediction. Simply due to the fact that had he not had the name James on the back of his jersey, Bronny would be a backup on a bad college team. Bronny up to this point in his career simply has not been a standout player by any metric. Although with long arms and above average athleticism with some goat genetics makes his defensive ceiling high, we really have yet to see his offensive game begin to formulate at all. Playing on the very stacked Sierra Canyon roster, Bronny put up a respectable 14 points, 5 rebounds, and 2 assists with nearly 2 rips a game, which although it may have been a bit overkill, was enough for Bronny to be slotted in as the 20th ranked prospect in his class on ESPN's Top 100 board. Although the world has had their eyes on Bronny and his development since basically the time he was born, the criticisms would not start pouring in until until Bronny would graze a collegiate floor the following season. It was clear in high school that although being significantly shorter than his dad, Bronny was a much different player than his dad. But still, most people really believed that there was no reason to think they couldn't play his role at a high level of competition. In high school, Bronny proved that he was an athletic point guard with great defensive instincts, a good looking jump shot for him, and flashes of playmaking that make you hopeful that he could come anywhere near his sky eye ceiling. But off of a little more to go off than mixtapes and highlight reels, college was a rude awakening of the status of Bronny's development. Despite being labeled at 6'4", Bronny was clearly undersized at the point guard position, and as his official height measurement would change to 6'1", this 2.5 inch drop certainly changed the way you look at his potential on the floor. His undersized build certainly wasn't the only concern, but became a much bigger concern when his skill was put under a microscope. Playing a limited role on a bad team, Bronny was only able to average 4.8 points per game on a miserable 36% from the field and 27% from three in 19 minutes a game. Putting up bad stats on a bad team was enough of a cause for concern for him to fall from late first round in the preseason mock draft boards to all the way off of the draft board completely. It's really... How can you blame them? As a 6 foot 1 guard who averaged just 2 assists per game in high school, his playmaking skills are heavily speculative and unproven to put it generously. His defense is heavily limited by height as well as his finishing around the basket which is kinda poor altogether. To make matters worse, a longtime concern of Bronny's game, which is his high and loose handle on the ball, was to where USC would force other players to bring up the ball, running a 6 foot 1 guard who shoots 27% from 3 as an off ball player. I mean, the potential role that this guy could play, other than being the CEO of jersey sales in the NBA, is hard to conjure up. He doesn't look confident on the floor, his skills aren't really anywhere near an NBA level, and he really seems to be figuring out his place as a player. But regardless of his situation, as a guy mocked out of the draft boards, every Every NBA scout saying this kid isn't an NBA player and multiple possible developmental years left at the college level, Bronny took to the NBA draft portal as an inefficient 5 point per game scorer that's undersized for his position. With all eyes on him at the NBA draft combine, Bronny was able to greatly climb up the ladder of potential draft prospects after clocking a vertical leap over 40 inches, a wingspan over 6 foot 7, and a 19 for 25 score behind the 3 point line. Although impressive and promising signs nonetheless, this really meant very very little, since we all knew that the Lakers at 55th overall had their eyes on Bronny from the start. As LeBron James for years has said he wanted to play alongside his son, the Lakers were quickly able to look past the potential value of a late second rounder for the guarantee of a whole lot of money and keeping their star happy. You may try to counter that, hey, given his health concerns in his freshman season and given his great combine measurements, how bad of a pick could this be? Even given the surging value of second rounders making real impact in the NBA with advanced analytics making statistical outliers easier and easier to find, late second rounders have been proven to be little more than just a gamble. Rarely lasting over a couple of years in the NBA, but it is still very difficult to find any player drafted in the NBA with anywhere near the lack of productivity that Bronny's miserable freshman year displayed. With medial averages of around 10 points and 5 rebounds a night in college for a late second rounder, Bronny's stat line of under 5 points and 3 rebounds have only been seen twice in Shek Diallo and Roberto Tovs, first of which was a physical freak and second of which was a physically gifted big man, and none of which was an undersized guard who couldn't shoot or handle the ball at an adequate collegiate level. The more and more you dig into Bronny James, the more and more this looks like one of the worst selections in NBA history. But hey, with a four year guaranteed deal playing alongside his dad, it's gonna make history in one way or another. But with a position that was more so given than earned in an ocean of pressures and expectations, with what we know about his 
game thus far, it's hard to imagine him rising to the top rather than drowning at the bottom, which certainly was the case for Jalil Okafor. It was really hard to imagine a flop this bad after Jalil's dominating high school career, historic college season, and all-rookie first-team performance in the NBA. But Jalil Okafor was certainly one that was doomed for disaster from the start. Jalil's been a household name for a number of years due to his domination on the AAU scene and at the high school level. And as a 6'9 beast with ridiculous touch, great footwork, a deep bag of post moves and counter moves out of each of them, it would have been difficult to not absolutely dominate the high school game. Ripping up the Chicago and national scenes, Okafor was your state and national player of the year in 2014 and took his talents to the next level where alongside Justice Winslow and Tyus Jones, these guys were one of the more dominant college teams in recent memory. But really, the game plan was just to get the ball to Jalil and ride his coattails into the sunset. At 17 points with 8.5 boards a game on a dominant 66% from the field, Jalil put on an absolute clinic on the block, taking home the AACT Player of the Year and the National Championship Trophy in dominating fashion. With some of the most impressive interior scoring that the game's seen in a while, Jalil was one of the most polished post scorers that college basketball had ever seen, and for most of the season, held the throne as the first overall draft pick in the 2015 NBA Draft. Despite the ongoing dominance throughout the season, the emerging talents of Carl Anthony Towns for the Kentucky Wildcats started to steal some buzz away from the Jalil show. See, and what was actually a bit weird looking back at it, at 10 points with under 7 boards and 2.3 blocks a game, Carl Anthony Towns was coming into the league as a defensive anchor with offensive potential. And with 2 3 balls and 8 attempts all year, he wasn't close to the Carl Anthony Towns that we know now. And frankly, when it comes to his play at the collegiate level, he really wasn't even that close to Jalil Oka. For. Jalil was far and away the best player at the collegiate level. What caused the sudden drop off of Okafor's draft stock wasn't his competition, wasn't a fall off of his own production, and really didn't even have to do with his weakness as a player. Although there was concern for Okafor's defensive weaknesses as a big man especially, everyone already knew this. What the world didn't see coming was the radical shift in play style set forth by the Golden State Warriors in 2015. Basketball since the beginning has been dominated by interior scoring bigs who can demand defensive attention and score or create for for others due to their offensive gravity, but rapidly in the NBA, that power dynamic completely shifted to pulling all defensive attention away from the basket to create some of the most efficient offenses in NBA history. This wave really was yet to hit the college game, but certainly hit scouts radars, as although his totals really couldn't hold up independently at all against Okafor, Towns became the consensus number one for the Minnesota Timberwolves, which left the Los Angeles Lakers at number two. With Kobe on his way out in his last year and Jordan Clarkson as well as Julius Randle looking to start the reboot of the Los Angeles Lakers, this left a hole at the center position that Jalil certainly could fill. And with Randle coming off of injury, there was hopes that the other posts could help space the floor alongside Okafor and make up for some of his defensive and rebounding woes, while all of the young players would have the honor of learning under Kobe in his final season. But the Lakers found a different option. Likely seeing the way that the league was shifting, the Lakers chose to opt with their guard of the future instead in D'Angelo Russell, opting with space and pace over interior presence. Although his fit certainly didn't work out great, this left Jalil Okafor to the Sixers, which really couldn't have been worse. After drafting Nerlens Noel and Joel Embiid in the years prior, Jalil landed on the worst team in the NBA that already had two players at his position, with an injured Embiid and underperforming Nerlens Noel and a tanking roster smack in the middle of the process. This meant that this thing was the Jalil show. With a whole lot of touches and a loose leash on the floor, Jalil had the freedom to make the 76ers his. And in response, Okafor put up a very respectable 17.5 and, and 7 boards a night. It really wasn't a bad season whatsoever, sliding into an all rookie first team and coming in fifth in rookie of the year voting. Okafor instantly was a guy that you could routinely go to for inside looks, and one year into his career, there wasn't really a peep for many doubters knocking his play. But the further you dig into this season, the easier it is to understand understand the emptiness of his play. At 10 and 72, these Sixers were one of the worst teams that the NBA has ever seen, and that's no exaggeration. Starting out 0-16, these guys were in full-on tank mode, and with tempers flaring, Okafor would find himself in the center of a controversy after shoving a fan in Boston. To make things worse, 
Jalil would suffer a torn meniscus that would sideline him 29 games this season. But even while he was still playing, Jalil was one of the least effective players in the NBA, with the team's worst 16 point on off differential per 100 possessions. Ouch. The holes in Oak Four's game became very visible very quickly. Not only was he an abysmal defender who seemed to really care less about that side of the floor, but even with solid totals of 17 points a game on above 50% from the field, when he can't spread the floor for your teammates, run a pick and roll, or pass out of double teams in the low post, you really can't be an effective offensive player unless you're over the top dominant, which Jalil certainly wasn't. Jalil would be completely outshined by Joel Embiid after basically one game in the NBA. And since that day, Philly fans have essentially forgotten about the Jalil Okafor experiment ever since it happened. After playing limited minutes in an injury ridden sophomore season, Okafor would request a trade out of Philadelphia, who would then let his talents rot on the bench for months to come before finally finding a taker for his mediocre talents. As Okafor would bounce from team to team, putting up upwards of 8 points per game on 60% shooting, this still wasn't enough to lock up a long term deal for a 25 year old who was just the best big man in college basketball. Jalil really didn't disappoint in any way as anyone who watched him throughout his younger years likely wasn't surprised at the final product at all. But as the NBA completely evolved into a different style of play, Jalil's one-dimensional game was really just left in the past. Although Jalil undeniably had some talents when he entered the NBA, it seems that Hashim Thabit had the absolute opposite problem. Hashim Thabit was a very raw and unpolished prospect upon conclusion of his high school career. In fact, with no real coordination, no touch, no post moves, no jump shot, and no handle on the ball, skills-wise, Hashim was absolutely brutal. But standing at around 7'2 to 7'2, and three, Hashim was still dominating and putting up 16, 10, and 4 blocks a game after only playing basketball for a few years. With a very limited scouting pool having only been in America for a couple years, and being a major project player in general, his collegiate offers were very limited. Therefore, when coach Jim Calhoun at UConn was willing to take on the assignment due to the potential of having a 7 foot 3 anchor beating shots like volleyballs, but according to coach Calhoun, when the beat arrived at UConn his freshman year, this kid just straight up couldn't play. At, all. at just 6 points a game in 24 minutes his freshman season, it became very clear that this guy's offensive skill set was pretty much non-existent. He couldn't really create space to be a dump off or a lob guy, his hands weren't good at all, his feet were clunky, he couldn't shoot, and he had no touch. But with just under a crazy 4 blocks a game, it seemed like every shot around the basket Hashim got his hands on. As the beat would see an increase in minutes the following season, his numbers would rise to 10 and 8 with a ridiculous 4.5 blocks a game. Despite his clear and massive holes in his game, I mean, 4.5 blocks is some Dikembe Mutombo level rim protection. And Hashim's the beat started garnering heaping amounts of attention as the Yukon Huskies were one of the best teams in college his junior season. Hashim soared north of 13 and a half a game his junior year on over 60% from the field. Although his block numbers did fall a tad to 4.2 a game, he was still putting up video game defensive numbers while his offensive output seemed good enough to be serviceable in the NBA, given that he was expected to be an immediate defensive star. Hashim for the majority of the season mocked in around the third pick in the 2009 NBA draft. However, under the radar there were certainly lots of scouts who weren't anywhere near sold on Thabit as a prospect whatsoever. For starters, of course, his offensive game was poor. There were no signs that Hashim was going to be growing into an even average offensive player in the NBA, as all of his points were from dump-offs where his guard generated the points for him, or offensive rebounds just from being big and being in the right spot. But really, even there, that wasn't the end of the criticisms. Thabit proved himself as an elite shot blocker at the college level. But outside of the college level, there really isn't any defensive studs with foot speed anywhere near this slow. When not relying on his size, Thabit really hadn't proved himself as a pick and roll defender or a low post guy over anyone with a decent big guy. Despite being in a draft class with some incredible talents including Steph Curry, DeMar DeRozan, James Harden, Jeff Teague, Blake Griffin, and Drew Holiday, Hashim Thabit would be taken second overall after BG in one of the most stacked NBA drafts of the 21st century. Although the pick kind of made sense on paper with Griffin off the board and the Grizzlies having a major hole at the center spot with Marcus All yet to break out and OJ Mayo and Mike Conley looking like the Grizzlies guards of the future, Memphis was hoping that with the existing offensive talent, they would be able to hide Hashim a bit as he develops while he instantly steps into the role as their new defensive anchor. But boy were they wrong. As Hashim arrived on the scene at practice, it took assistant coach Damon Studemeyer a whopping 10 minutes of watching Thabit play to realize they royally screwed this one up. 
10 minutes. Everything that the scouts worried about his game seemed to be worst case scenario. At 3 points per game with 1.3 blocks, Hashim clocked twice as many fouls as blocked shots and more fouls than buckets this year. Frankly, when it comes to just being a worse player than the scouts anticipated, Hashim Thabit is the most disappointing player drafted this high ever. Failing to score over 2 points for the rest of his career, there was really little that Hashim did to a high level when he couldn't just stand under the basket and block shots. His offensive game was as brutal as you'd expect, and his defense was beyond disappointing for who was supposed to be literally an all-time defender. The mix of his lack of strength guarding NBA and his lack of foot speed on pick and rolls led to frequent foul trouble that he never figured out. And after just one year, the second overall pick was playing in the D-League. The beat would be moved from Houston to Portland, then to OKC, where he would play out his final years in the NBA. Although sadly, Thabit would never crack a role simply due to him never really being an NBA player, Hashim would earn the respect of his teammates and coaches alike throughout this short stint. Despite being labeled as a bust and a failure immediately entering the NBA, Hashim worked harder than superstars and challenged his teammates day after day to do the best he could in his limited role in the NBA. After just five short years, Thabit would play his final game of the league, finishing with career averages of 2.2 points and 2.7 rebounds with 0.8 blocks a game. Hashim's career was certainly nowhere near what we hoped for him, but likely due to all the effort he put in and the attitude he had towards the game, Hashim is one of those busts that you don't hear about that often. He had the heart and he just simply didn't have the talent. And if that doesn't sound like the absolute opposite of Ben Simmons, then I don't know what does. Ben Simmons had it all. Best player in high school by a landslide, number one pick in the draft, awards, achievements, and a lock for one of the best players in the league moving forward. Fast forward now, and he's riding the bench, barely finding a role in the NBA. A result that was shocking to many, but really the future of Ben Simmons was staring us in the eyes from the start. Ben Simmons was an anomaly from the beginning of his career, really up until now. There really isn't anyone else with a story like his. Coming from a dad who was putting up 40 bombs in the Australian basketball leagues, there really wasn't a level of youth basketball that Ben Simmons wasn't absolutely dominating. Simmons dropped all other loves which really were just other sports because this kid could care less about anything to do with academics and set his focus on becoming the best prospect in the world. And. He was successful, taking up a scholarship to play at the Institute of Sport in 2012 and representing the Australian national team at 15 years old. I mean, I know we take international accomplishments way more seriously now than we used to, but even at this time, I remember watching videos of this freaky athletic freshman who could handle the ball and pass the ball at 6 foot 8. But to really step into the brightest lights, Ben Simmons would transfer to Montverde Academy in Florida to turn up the recruiting hype tenfold. Playing alongside future Eskimo bro and D'Angelo Russell, the two were far and away the best duo in the country. As Simmons soared to the top of the ESPN Top 100 list, averaging 18.5 points with 10 boards and 3 assists a game on the 28-0 national champions as a junior, the show was really on the road here. Ben Simmons was the best high school player in the 2015 class, and it wasn't even a debate. Simmons could shift bigs or guards off the bounce, find shooters, rollers, or dump offs, grab a board and fly out in transition, kick out a double teams if he had to, and if all else failed, he could just bulldoze to the rim and dunk over whoever he wanted to. Simmons was so talented that even for the most elite players in high school basketball, there was really no answer to his game. It may seem like an irrelevant achievement, especially given where he landed, but Ben Simmons was truly one of the best players to ever play basketball in the states. At 28 points with 12 rebounds, 4 assists and 2.6 steals a game shooting 70% from the field with a Naismith and Gatorade Player of the Year award. Barring injury, nobody was going to stop Ben Simmons from going number one in the 2016 draft. And even if he did get injured, he still might be your consensus number one pick. With legitimate comparisons to LeBron James, this actually looked like the closest we've seen out of the many way far off comparisons to King James himself. Despite being able to choose which school he wanted to be the face of, Simmons took the road much less traveled to go and dominate on the not competitive LSU Tigers. Putting up 19, 12, and 5 a game, it was clear that Ben Simmons had all of the talent in the world that we had been witnessing for years prior. Ben Simmons left his mark on the NCAA despite missing out on the March Madness tournament. And for good or for bad, there were a lot of areas that Ben could improve on his game. He was already by far the best transition player in the draft, and really one of the best that we have ever seen at this level. He had the vision of an NBA point guard and the physical gifts that very, very few could compare to. Simmons was said to become an instant 
impact player in the NBA. But with his pretty poor back to the basket game, poor pick and roll play as a roll man and a ball handler, and his, of course, non existent jump shot, with some main key areas of improvement that, if he could improve on, could seriously unlock what would be one of the greatest players to ever lace them up. But in reality, there were a few downsides from picking Ben Simmons that the world was entirely overlooking. Simmons would be criticized by teammates and coaches alike for simply giving up when things weren't going his way, and for your very own to speak up on issues like that speaks wonders to his character. Ben Simmons at every level of basketball knew nothing other than pure domination, but really if the monsters could come and take away his god-given talent, there isn't any reason to believe he would find much success at all. He wasn't a very skilled player, but with a one in a billion frame with athleticism and coordination to pair, basketball was extremely, extremely easy for him compared to the average person. And without really having to struggle at any point in his journey to the league, how the hell would this kid react when the best coaches in the world can game plan against him and he's already showing the signs of a quitter? With the talent on the board, there was no question if the 76ers were going to take Simmons, and without hesitation, they created the duo of the future in Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons. He would be sidelined by injury in his rookie season, but if you thought he couldn't dominate the NBA off of talent alone, boy would you be wrong. At 16-8-8, Simmons put together one of the best rookie years to date. Off of little more than we had seen in the past, Ben Simmons helped carry this franchise to one of the best young cores in the NBA. But upon his first trip to the playoffs, the NBA and Ben Simmons were given a serious reality check. Off of excellent game planning from Brad Stevens and an excellent Ben Simmons stopper in Al Horford, playing to his weakness and eliminating his transition play as well as forcing him to make plays in the half court outside of the restricted area, absolutely shut down Ben Simmons harder than we've really seen any other star get stopped in the past. Highlighted by his infamous one point 0 for 5, 5 turnover performance. Simmons would go on in the next few years to rack up all-star games, earn discussion as one of the best defenders in the world, got a big old contract, and really seemed to be one that was ready to take over the NBA. But time after time, Ben Simmons would disappear when it matters the most. After an underperformance in 2019 against Toronto with the best Philly team since Allen Iverson in an injury-ridden 2020 campaign, Philadelphia quickly began to grow tired of Simmons' stagnant improvements and utter performance when put against the slightest bit of resistance. But all came crashing down, of course, in that infamous Atlanta Hawks series. Despite shooting 45 free throws, Simmons felt the average of measly 10 points a game, getting carried by Steph Curry's brother. And as the clock was ticking down with this chance of rebuttal, Simmons made the pass heard around the world, passing up a layup over a 4'5 traffic cone. Ben Simmons killed the momentum of this Philadelphia franchise so bad that even his own coach and teammates had to throw him under the bus for it. As times got tough and his fans and team seemed to turn on him, Ben Simmons would once again quit, requesting a trade out of Philadelphia. Simmons would be absent from all team activities until $8 million would be put on the line. And after being kicked out of practice for refusing to participate, he was then fined more money than most people make in a lifetime for refusing to do his job because some people People were mean to him. After being shipped out to what seemed like a much better fit, filling in as a playmaker and defender next to Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant, Simmons' play would see a disastrous fall off from up near a 17 point triple double down to 6, 8, and 6 as one of the least effective offensive players in the entire NBA. It's safe to say that although he had all of the talent in the world, if you conditioned your mind to quit, you may win the sprint, but the NBA is certainly a marathon. Simmons certainly ran into some bad luck on his journey in the NBA, but due to his response to his misfortunes, it's really hard to feel bad for him at all. But the same can certainly not be said for Greg Oden, who had one of the most heartbreaking careers in recent memory. Prior to the NBA, Greg Oden wasn't known as a good player. He was known as a generational one. Being labeled as the next Bill Russell in middle school, I mean, the expectations really spoke for themselves. Alongside his partner in crime, Odin and Mike Conley would lose in the state championship their freshman year to future NBA player Courtney Lee, who referred to them as the hardest matchup of his life, which stood true as the duo would sweep the next three straight championships in the state of basketball. At 22 points and 10.5 and rebounds on an unfair 74% from the field, Odin was one of the most ridiculous big men prospects of the 2000s. With tons of strength and touch inside, being a pretty solid all-around big man was enough to set him as the top player in the country. Due to his ridiculous defensive ability, being able to time his blocks without fouling, and with weirdly quick feet for someone of his size. Greg Oden was a freak who looked like he was made in a lab to deny you from scoring at the rim. Oden was everywhere. Mr. Basketball Awards, All-American MVPs, cover of magazines, and was labeled as the best prospect since Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. 
but as a quiet and humble kid, it really seemed like he just wanted to keep having fun on the court with his friends just like any other kid. And committing to Ohio State alongside Connolly continued that after the NBA added the one and done rule in which Odin was about to go first overall at high school. But at 16 and 10 with three blocks a game and some blockbuster moments like a game saving block and season saving block in the Sweet 16, and a very loud 25 points, 12 rebound, and four block performance in the national championship against two of the best interior defenders of the era. Greg Oden was set to make a splash in the NBA regardless. But as another star player out of Texas quickly began grabbing the world by storm with a major scoring explosion, this quickly made for one of the most controversial picks in a while. Despite what we know in retrospect, Greg Oden was the clear answer for the first overall selection. After Zach Randolph would leave the Blazers, this team was ran by emerging scorers in Marcus Aldridge and Brandon Roy. What they were missing was, well, Greg Oden. I couldn't think of a much better fit. But even if you're looking to disregard fit entirely, Odin was simply more impressive. With a higher vertical leap, insanely impressive lane agility again beating Durant in a faster three-quarter sprint, Greg Odin was really the right selection given what we know at the time. However, there was one major red flag that went completely under the radar when it came to draft time. Due to a hip surgery in the sixth grade, Greg Odin was balancing his seven-foot, 250-pound frame on his two legs that weren't the same length. Odin would proceed to injure his right knee, sidelining him for over a year of play prior to his rookie season, and as the Trailblazers would keep him off of his feet for a year, Odin would pile an extra 40 pounds onto his already injured knee and disproportionate lower body. This thing was really over before it started, but despite that, he was putting up per 36 minute numbers of 15 and 12 with two blocks, and 17 and 13 with three and a half blocks in the year to follow that. Greg Oden was seriously looking like the real deal in his time on the floor. Of the 62 games, in fact, that Aldridge Roy and Oden played on the floor together, they would go a crazy 52 and 10 during this time. Before, sadly, partway through his second year on the floor, Oden would blow out his knee for a second time, which led to a third, and soon after would lead to three and a half years off the floor. Oden is certainly one of the sadder cases, since really his play was everything we expected to be. But no matter what his excuse is, Oden was just another one of this list of players that was destined to fail from the jump. Thank you for watching. If you made it this far, and peace out.